Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Frank Morgan in The Pied Piper with Roddy McDowell, Ann Baxter, and Ralph Morgan. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. At Christmas time, it's fitting and proper that we should bring you a story about children. This story is as timeless as children themselves and as modern as Christmas 1942. It's called The Pied Piper, and it stars Frank Morgan with Roddy McDowell, Ann Baxter, and Ralph Morgan. A fine novel by Neville Shute gave 20th Century Fox Studio the opportunity for this original screen drama. The heroic story of a man past fighting age who found another way to serve humanity. I'm sure you'll like Frank Morgan in the leading part. He's one of the most completely talented men I know. Besides starring with Mickey Rooney in pictures like the human comedy at Metro-Golden-Mare Studios, Frank has a weekly radio program which adds a precious store of laughter to a busy world. You'll meet another side of him in the Pied Piper, a serious side. This week, Americans will be celebrating Christmas all the way from the Arctic to the tropics. We had a letter the other day from a lady in Fort Worth, Texas, who had our own idea for soldiers who may be dreaming of a white Christmas somewhere in the South Sea. She writes that two packages of Lux Flakes with full directions for making snow out of them are on their way to a South Pacific island for some of our soldiers. She also sent them tinsel rope and red candles. Now, there's a good deed. Of course, it's a little too late for the rest of you to send Lux Flake snow to the South Pacific. But there's plenty of time to put it on your own Christmas tree. And as you do it, you might think of a cocky-clad group way out there, perhaps with a different kind of tree, but the spirit is the same. Wherever two or three people of goodwill are gathered together, now the curtain rises on Act One of The Pied Piper, starring Frank Morgan as Mr. Howard, with Roddy McDowell as Ronnie, and Ann Baxter as Nicole. This is the story of an English gentleman named Mr. Howard, who became the father of six children all in the course of a few days. This sounds a bit incredible. But it's even more incredible when you take into account the fact that Mr. Howard didn't even like children. No, 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 no. It's not that I dislike children. I assure you I've never disliked children. It's, it's simply that they make me feel uncomfortable. I have no manner with them, if you know what I mean. They, they've, well, children are too bright. It was in the summer of 1940 that I first met young Ronnie Cavanaugh and his sister Sheila. They were staying at the same inn that I was in France, a quiet little place at the foot of the Alps near Switzerland. I'd been fishing there for a few days. Rather fair luck, too. I remember I came back to the inn one evening at sundown with my catch. The children were reading in the lounge, and Madame Picard was there, as always, standing in back of the little hotel desk. Ah, oh, Mr. Howard, you have good luck today, yes? Here you are, Madame, two very fine trout. One for me and one for you for supper. Monsieur, what an accomplishment. Mm. Two of them. Yeah. Look, children, are they not beautiful? My father caught five today. Oh, did he? Probably fishing with worms. Oh, no, sir. He was fitting, fishing with an artificial fly. Yesterday yeah. he caught ten. Really? Is that so? Oh, but Ronnie, your father is such a young man. Monsieur Howard, you must be tired. No, Sit I... down, rest. Yeah. I will take the fish to Emily in the kitchen. Well, thank you, madame. Good evening, Mr. Howard. Yes, yes, good evening. I've just been doing my lesson. Will you help me, Mr. Hart? Help you? Is, uh, is that regarded as ethical? Sir? Oh, it's quite all right, Mr. Howard. Everybody knows she cheats. Oh. You see, Mr. Hart, I have to name five states in the United States, and the only one I can think of is Texas. Texas, eh? Yes, well, let's see. Texas, and then... Uh... Then there's uh, California. That's right, California. And uh, Virginia. 
Virginian cigarettes, you know. Virginia? And, uh, Virginia, California, Texas. Uh, Rochester. Rochester? Yes. Rochester isn't a state. Really? Then may I ask what it is? Rochester's a city. It may very well be a city, young man. I don't deny that. I only contend that it's also a state. A state somewhat north, a bit to the northeast of the... Whether it is uh, of the uh, New England colony. But it's not, Mr. Howard. It's just a city, and that's all. Yeah. A city in the state of New York. Did anyone ask you? No, sir. Then you'll be doing me a great favor by keeping your irresponsible conjectures to yourself. Yes, sir. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening, Daddy. Evening, Mr. Howard. Yeah, good evening. Hello, Dad. Hello, son. Anybody tried the wireless this evening? We ought to be able to get some English news if Berlin hasn't jammed it. Dad? Is Rochester in the United States a city or a state? Rochester? Rochester's a city, of course. Why? Mr. Cavanaugh, have you any corroboration for that statement, or is that simply your opinion? I'm afraid I don't quite understand, sir. So uh, Mr. Howard told Sheila that Rochester's a state. Well, I must admit I've never heard the question raised before, but I really don't believe it is. And what would you say, sir, if I informed you that I myself have visited the state of Rochester? <laughs> in that case, naturally, I... I'd be compelled to admit that you were right, sir. Listen, Dad, I hear planes. Listen. Yeah. Quite a few, I imagine. They're German, Dad. They're Heinkel. You can tell by the motor. Ronald, Ronald, those planes again. Yes, dear. They're German, Mud, I can tell. I heard them pass this afternoon, and now they're coming back. Where could they have been, Ronald? I don't know. I can't understand. But the fighting is all up north in Belgium. Yes. Unless things are worse than we've heard. Is the wireless working? Is there any news, monsieur? There ought to be. It's just about time. Twice they passed today. Very high. Where are they going? Eh? Where? Here we are. I've got it. This is the overseas service of the British Broadcasting Company, London Calling. It would be idle to deny that Britain today faces a dark hour. The enemy continues to advance. More channel ports, French as well as Belgian, are now under German occupation. And under such circumstances, we must be prepared to face any eventuality even invasion. In this hour of darkness, let Englishmen, wherever they may be, in whatever lands beyond the sea, hear again, by transcription, the words of the Prime Minister before the House of Commons this morning, and be of good heart. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, on the landing grounds, in the fields, in streets, and on the hills. I'll never surrender. And even if, which I do not for one moment believe, this island or a part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the sea, armed and guarded by the British fleet, will carry on the struggle until, in God's good time, the new world, with all its Power and might sets forth to the liberation and rescue of the old. One moment, please. Ronald, turn it off. Ronald, It I... is worse than we thought. Yes, but we are well out of it here, eh, Monsieur Howard? They will never fight this far south. We could hide out here for years. And for you and me, at our age, Monsieur Howard... That is a very comforting thought. Are you finished? Oh, yes, monsieur. Then allow me to inform you, sir, that if ever again you address one word to me, I shall take the greatest of pleasure in thrashing you within an inch of your life, regardless of your age. Yes, sir. Madame Picard, there's a train for Paris at 9 o'clock, isn't there? Why, yes, monsieur, but... I shall be taking it. Please arrange with the station master for my reservation to London by way of Paris and St. Malo. But, monsieur, you've only been here three days. Three days of which I am heartily ashamed. I'll pack my things at once. Mr. Howard. Yes? I hope you're not being hasty because of anything this man has said. I can assure you that no one here believes for one second that you're here for, well, for any but the best of reasons. No, I'm here because, because I'm a selfish and pig-headed old man. I offered my services to every department of the government in London. But I, I was not needed. I was too old. In all of London, I was taken seriously by but one man, my vicar. He suggested to me that I knit, knit for the soldiers. I'm afraid that I took some exception to his well-meant suggestion. But to run away like a sulky child was wrong, and I'm deeply ashamed of myself. That's not my point, sir. 
As you say yourself, you're not young. There is no other point. Young or old, an Englishman's place at a time like this is in England. And if the trains are running, I shall be there in 18 hours. To knit. An hour later, I was in my room, still packing, when Mrs. Cavanaugh asked to see me. She seemed quite strained and nervous. Mr. Howard, do you know what my husband does? No, I can't say that I do. He's an official of the League of Nations at Geneva. And in Geneva, they think that Switzerland is very likely to be invaded next. Do they really? That's where we're going tonight, back to Geneva. But is that very wise if there's danger there? Well, that's not what matters. It happens to be his post of duty. I see. But if Hitler does come, there won't be much food. There never is under him. A filthy little gutter snipe. Well, for myself, I'm not afraid. No, my husband. It's the children we're thinking of. Oh, yes? Mr. Howard, yes. would you take them with you back to England? Do what? It would only be to Plymouth. My sister would meet you there with the car and... Oh, I know it's asking an awful lot. Well, I know what you mean. That boy, too? Please, he didn't mean to be rude. He's really a very good child. And he'll behave, I promise you. Mrs. Cavanaugh, I... Please. No, 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 no. It's impossible. I'm sorry. But it's, it's out of the question. Really, I couldn't. I simply couldn't. That night, I left for Paris with Ronnie Cavanaugh and his sister, Sheila. And are we taking the train, Mr. Howard? Of course we are. Yes, yes, we are. And then we sleep on the train, will we? I expect so, yes. <laughs> she won't. What's that? She won't sleep on the train. What do you mean? Why won't she? Because she always gets sick on the train. Sick right on the floor. I don't either. You do. I don't. Of course you do. I do not. Now, please, let's not dispute the fact. Time will tell us who is correct, I'm afraid. The argument was settled an hour after we boarded the train. Sheila was quite sick. <laughs> With the kind aid of a French lady on the train, I took care of Sheila as best I could. The French lady had a child of her own and seemed to understand these things. Are you comfortable, mon petit? Oui, madame. She speaks French, yes? Madame, what uh, what seems to be the trouble with her? She's sick, monsieur. Yes, that I quite understand. I told you she'd be sick. Quiet, quiet. It is strange sickness, monsieur. But besides, she has fever. Fever? Maybe she has eaten something. Maybe she's been too hot in a draft. That is the way it is with children. Well, does she need a doctor? No. If she can rest a little while, keep warm, she will be all right soon. I see. Well, Ronnie, how are you? Oh, very fit, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I thought so. Where is little Rose? <laughs> Rose, viens ici. Oui, madame. Récit pour la petite fille. Monsieur, Rose will recite for your little girl. She will enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How do you do, little Rose? Comment allez-vous, monsieur? Récit, Rose. Ma grand-tante demeure à tour dans une maison avec un cerisier, avec une petite souris. Quick, quick. Mr. Howard, why are you stopping here? I don't know, but I shall certainly find out. Now, don't move. I'll be right back. Now, just a moment, my good man. But, monsieur... I want to know when the next train leaves for Paris. To Paris? There is no more yes. trains to Paris, monsieur. No trains to the north at all. But I hold tickets. I report you to the management. Monsieur, do you not understand? The Germans have crossed the Mars. The whole France is breaking. Maybe the trains will never run again. Never, but I have two small children. At your age, monsieur, that is undoubtedly magnificent. <laughs> but if this is a contest, I have nine. Now, look here. Mr. Howard, quick. Ronnie, I told you to stay on the train. Listen, there's a bus outside to shot. Shot? Why shot? There's a train there to Saint-Malo. The chef de gare told me. Well, then let's catch it by all means. Come along. Well, Ronnie, this was a bit of luck, all right, I must say. This bus idea was very clever of you. Very... Clever indeed. Thank you, sir. 
I expect that if you could break yourself of a certain insufferable pig-headedness, you'd be almost bearable. Are you comfortable, Sheila? Yes, sir. Come on, Dally Boomer's here. Well, 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 little Rose. So you caught the bus, too, eh? Fine. And where's your mother, little Rose? Uh, that wasn't her mother, sir. How? That was her aunt. Well, where's her aunt? Good heavens, did we leave her behind? Uh, well, yes, sir. What is this? Uh, Rose, send Louise, le papi. What are you saying to her? I'm asking her for a piece of paper her aunt gave her. Well, uh, here it is, sir. There's something written on it. Yeah. Henri Tenoir, Dickens Hotel, Russell Square, London. I don't understand. Who is this Henri Tenoir? That's Rosa's father. He's a waiter. But of what possible interest could his address be? Oh, so that's it. I'm to burden myself with another child. But, Mr. Howard, they hadn't any home. The Germans burnt it down. He didn't have anywhere to go at all, don't you see? Mm, come one, come all, eh? But you wouldn't want them to be caught by the Germans, would that's you, That's not the point, sir. <laughs> Oh, not so, Mr. Howard, I like her. Don't you see, sir? Rose can take care of Sheila, and I can take care of her. So you'll have no bother. Yes, that's all very neatly arranged, eh? Well, perhaps I have something to say on the subject. I do not propose to become the mecca of every unfortunate child in France. No, sir. When we get the shot, I shall turn her over to the authorities and leave it to them to get her back to her aunt. Yes, sir. It's the only intelligent way to deal with such situations. Yes, sir. Sheila... Will, will you tell Rose what Mr. Howard's going to do? All right. Rose, please. Rose. Yes, uh, uh, just a moment. Yes, sir? Uh, <coughs> what was the name of that hotel? The Dickens Hotel, sir. I never heard of it in my life. But I, I imagine we'll be able to find it. Oh, Mr. Howard. Thank you, sir. <laughs> We were about 40 miles from Schatz when the bus stopped to repair a tire. It was a lovely day. There was a stream just off the road where we sat down to have our lunch under the trees. And then the planes came. German planes. They dropped out of the sky, swung down toward the road in the bus. It didn't seem possible that they were trying to kill us. Are we all right? Sheila, Rose. Yes, sir. I'm going back to the bus to see if I can get our bags. And children, while I'm gone, I want you to promise me, don't, don't look that way. Now, you won't, will you? Stay right here now. Ronnie, I'm going to look. No, Ronnie, don't. Sheila, look. There's dead people there. Dead people. We were still there on the road when night came, and I herded the three children into a deserted old barn to sleep. But then I noticed that there were no longer three children. There were four. The fourth was a boy with a pale, thin face and the dull, glazed eyes of a child in fear. He couldn't seem to talk. He, he only repeated one phrase over and over. Mom. Miss Almang, Miss Almang. This, uh, this child, is he with us now? Yes, sir. Uh, I brought him in, sir. Miss Almang. He can't talk, Mr. Hart. That's all he says. Miss Almang, the German. Who is he? His name is Pierre. How did you learn that? He told us. But he can't talk. No. May I speak to you privately, sir? Well, yes, of course. Mr. Howard. He was in the bus, sir. Didn't you see him? Yeah. The dead people, sir. They were his mother and father. I see. He can't speak, and I don't think he can hear either. I see. Here. Here, lad. Let, let, uh, let me see you. Look up here. Miss Almang. Miss Almang. Yes, yes, my boy. We'll take care of you now. You, 
You have nothing to fear from now on, my boy. Mr. Howard, sir. Yes, Ronnie. I can't sleep, sir. Oh, well, you must try. Yes, sir. Mr. Howard. Yes? I'm sorry I was rude the other night about Rochester. Oh, that's, that's quite all right. It doesn't matter in the least. I was wrong, you know. No, no, not at all. I may very well have been wrong myself. So many of those American states. Kansas, Massachusetts, Massachusetts whatever. What's the Indian state? Massachusetts. Massachusetts, yes, that's it. Seemed very likely there might be another named Rochester. No reason why not, you know. Oh, none whatever, sir. Hmm. I remember it very well now, sir. You do? Oh, yes, sir. A very important industrial state. Well, I'm not such an old fuddy-duddy after all, eh? I should say not, sir. <laughs> My memory may have gone a bit ragged here and there, but when it comes to geography, you'll generally find I'm pretty good. Oh, I can see that, sir. <laughs> yeah. Well, very decent of you to acknowledge it, too. Thank you, sir. Well, good night, my boy. Good night, sir. In a moment, we'll hear Act Two of The Pied Piper, starring Frank Morgan, with Roddy McDowell, Ann Baxter, and Ralph Morgan. But between the acts, Sally and I have a story for you. It's called, Where There's a Wool, There's a Way. Or, Leave it to Lux. It's a continued story, because when you leave it to Lux to care for them, the sweaters and scarves and socks and mittens, all the washable woolies you get for Christmas, will continue to wear longer. And it's an escape story. Because with gentle Lux care, you escape things that are particularly hard on woolens. There's no harmful alkali, no need for hot water, none of the cake soap rubbing that's so apt to shrink and harshen the soft woolen fibers. It's a story that needs to be told, too, these days when wool is so precious. You know how wonderful Lux is for woolens, but it's a thoughtful idea to tuck a box of Lux in with the woolies you give for Christmas. Your gifts will be better appreciated the longer they last. And they'll last longer, wear better, when you Lux them. But, Sally, let's get right down to the facts of our story. How to wash a sweater. Chapter one. Draw an outline of your sweater on a big sheet of paper. Then, make rich, lukewarm Lux studs and squeeze them gently through the sweater. Don't rub, don't wring or twist. Chapter two. Rinse thoroughly in water the same lukewarm temperature. Then roll in a Turkish towel to take out excess moisture. Chapter three. Unroll. And pin it with rust-proof pins to the outline you made before you luxed it. Then dry flat, away from heat. So there's our story. A story that really begins when you buy a big box of Lux Flakes and leave it to Lux to care for your precious woolens. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Piper, starring Frank Morgan as Mr. Howard, with Roddy McDowell as Ronnie, and Ann Baxter as Nicole. As the Pied Piper of old led his children to a happy land beyond the mountain, so our Piper, Mr. Howard, tried to lead them beyond the sea to security, to safety, to England. It took us three days to reach Chat. I remembered then that I had a friend there, a young lady named Nicole Rougeron, whom I had met on a vacation in St. Moritz. I decided I would appeal to her for help. Monsieur Awa. Oh, monsieur. You, you remember me, mademoiselle. But naturally, monsieur. Come in, please, quickly. Uh, yes, well, I, but I'm not alone. 
Come in, and the little ones, too. Oh, thank you. Hell, come in. Come in, children. Maman, Maman, you remember Monsieur Howard last year at Saint Maurice? Howard. Madame, I am happy oh, to please. see you. If you speak English, close the door. Come inside. If you speak English today, is not safe. Not safe for any of us. I know, madame, and I have no, no wish... No, 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 please. We must be careful. That is all. Our friends are still our friends. Regardless. That is very kind of you, madame. But, monsieur, the children. You did not have them last year. Madame, some of them I did not have 24 hours ago. <laughs> we, uh, we are on our way to England. Allow me to introduce them. Madame Rougeron, Mademoiselle Nicole Rougeron. This is Ronald, a fine lad. And this is his sister, Sheila. And this is Rose. And this here is Pierre. And this is... is... Who is this? I'm from Nam Kenneth de Marken, Miss Val. What? Where did you come from? I've never seen this one in my life. Ronnie! Uh, yes, sir? When did he join us? Oh, he's been with us on and off since yesterday. I see. You mean, monsieur... You do not know who he is? No, but on this trip, that doesn't seem to be necessary. <laughs> Boy, where did you spring from? Come on, speak up. It's Honey Postan, Manier. That's Dutch. His name is Willem. Not William, Willem. Yes, how do you know that, Sheila? He told us. Now, listen to this, mademoiselle. Sheila, do you speak Dutch? Oh, no, sir. Do you understand Dutch? No, sir. But he told you? Yes, sir. Then in what language did he tell you? In no language. He just told us. Yeah. Well, I suppose there must be some normal explanation for this system of communication. Very well, Willem. We'll do what we can for you. Of course, of course. The poor little ones. I wonder if they would like something to eat. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Of course they would. Just come with me. Oh, it sounds good. Yes, they understand that all right, too. I'm occasionally seized with the conviction that I'm convoying guinea pigs. You are, uh, you understand that you are in great danger here. I do. But I promise you I shan't involve you and your mother. In just a few minutes, when I've rested a bit, we'll be on our way. But I was hoping to see Colonel Boucheron also. We have not heard from our father for several months. At that time, he was at his regiment before met. Oh, you... You have my sympathy, mademoiselle. I understand. You see... You see, I, too, have suffered a loss. You, you remember my son, Jean? Jean? Hmm. Oh, yes, but... I, I regret to inform you that he... He was killed. He was in the RAF, you know. Shot down over Helgoland two months ago. Gave a very decent account of himself, I understand, before the... Before they got him. Then he's dead. Excuse me, please. Mademoiselle Nicole was very kind. She helped us arrange for tickets on the train. When we left for Chat, she even came along with us. May I ask now where we are bound? To the channel, monsieur. Uh. The prison is There is someone there that I know who might help. But was this necessary for you, this, this long, not very safe trip? Even if someone else could have done it, monsieur, about, I would not permit it. It is a thing that I must do myself. Myself alone, nobody else. Mademoiselle, I appreciate this, even if I don't understand it. It would be just a year ago, wouldn't it? that month in San Luis. But a long year and a sad one. Yes. It's quite all hard to realize. Every now and then I feel that it's all a dream. Presently we'll all wake up. Perhaps John will walk in and we'll sit down and talk together again. I know. Took free to bring him down, you know. You, uh, you remember him kindly, don't you? Yes. Him, his letters. Our last, our only visit together in Paris. You saw him in Paris? Once. Just once, for three days. That was just before the invasion. We had a, a beautiful three days. I, I had no idea of that. We told nobody. 
In time, he would have, I suppose. He planned to anyway. Then he went back. And I waited to hear from him. It's funny. You wait and wait, day after day. You wait for a letter. And then it comes. But, but it's not from him. It's from his squadron. So for a long time, you do not open it. He sits and holds it in your hand, wishing you need never open it. Because you know that a letter from his squadron, from his friend, can have but one thing to tell. And then at last, you do open it. My dear child. And then after that, your whole world is darker than it was before. Nicole's loss had been as great as mine. And I understood then why she had come with us. We went to a little town near the channel to the home of Nicole's uncle. With the children off to bed, he listened to our story, smoking his pipe, nodding quietly. What do you propose now, Nicole? You have fishing boats, Uncle. You know young men, daring young men. Can you not find one who will take Monsieur Howard and the children across the channel? I'm quite prepared to pay, you understand. And what is the price of a man's life, Monsieur? Uncle, there are little children. They must not be left here. Our country is no longer a place for children. Our country is no longer our country. You do not know, Nicole. You have not begun to learn what it is to live under the bush. How do I know I can trust you? How do I know this is not a trap? But I know him, Uncle. I know him very well. How do I know I can trust you? Why, John? How do you know you can trust me? I don't need to even think of such things. Under the bush, child, that is what happens. As I have said before, I have no wish to involve anyone else in my own personal problems. I shall, of course, leave the house. No, no, please. Let me sleep on it, monsieur. Perhaps tomorrow. Listen. Do you hear? It is a raid. On breast. Why? It is the harbor. They're after the ships. Why, those filthy... No, no, monsieur. It is a British raid. Those are British planes. British? That is it. They're after Hitler. There was a report in Brest today that he was there inspecting the invasion fleet. Well, after Mr. Schickel, Grover, eh? Well... Mr. Howard, what is it? Is it a raid, sir? I should say it is. Those are British planes, my boy. The RAF. The yeah, RAF? Yeah. Yes, I've got to go and get a look at this, by George. Yes, there they are, see. Bang, that's it, boys. Bang. Hit them again. Bang, bang. By George, this is the greatest thing I ever saw in my life. Bang. It was late that night when Nicole's uncle came to my room. I have found the man who made all the arrangements. His name is Roquet, and he's bought it at the fishing village just 10 kilometers from here. You and Nicole will meet him tomorrow in a cafe near the docks. Nicole knows. Roquet, Monsieur Roquet. Nicole, ah! Que diable faites vous ici? Mon grand-père, Monsieur Howard. Monsieur Howard, ne comprends pas le français. Oh, it's all right. You have the boat. The boat. It is by the bottom of the lighthouse. You understand? Yes. From the outside of the cafe, you will see the lighthouse to the right. You understand? Yes. When do we start? Tonight. Now. The sooner, the better. Bonsoir. Bonsoir, Nico. Bonsoir, Grand-Père. Good Bonsoir, Monsieur There is the lighthouse, monsieur. And there is the boat. <laughs> Sheila. Yes. Stop here. Okay? Here. This way. Well, I suppose this is goodbye. Bon voyage, monsieur. My child. Won't, won't you come with us to England? No, monsieur. I am not English. I am French. And you have told me yourself that in times of trouble, one should be in one's own country and do what one can to help. This is where I belong, here. Yes, but afterward... Oh, afterward, I shall come. <laughs> well, goodbye, my child. Goodbye, monsieur. Prompter! Prompter! Mr. Howard! Shh! 
Look at the Indian boat thing. Right at the Indian man. Oh, here, look at this. They're German soldiers. Oh, you are leaving us, eh? You're English, yes? Well? I am English. This young lady is not. She is French. You will come with me. All of you. But I tell you, you that will you... come with me. Hello, sir. Ah, the boatman. You are English also? I am French. Boom, a step up, poor soul, boss, Now, monsieur, you will come this way. Please. Mr. Howard, they... They really got us, haven't they? Well, it looks that way, lads. <laughs> Oh, Pierre. Pierre. Miss Armand. Miss Armand. Miss Armand. Roddy McDowell, Ann Baxter, and Ralph Morgan will return in just a moment for Act Three of The Pied Piper. Now, would you like to know how to make your own Christmas weather? Or at least your own homemade snowstorm? Well, let's look in at this window. Here, where we can see the Christmas tree. There is a pretty girl mixing something in a bowl. Now, we're ready. See? A big bowl of snow. Now you spread it along the branches, like this. There. Doesn't that look lovely? Just as though our tree had been out in a real snowstorm. Yes, you can have beautiful, real-looking snow for your tree. Snow that will last the whole holiday season, made of pure white Lux flakes. It's a lot of fun to make. The whole family can help with it. And it's a grand idea for a Christmas Eve party. Here's how you make Lux snow. Pour a big box of Lux flakes into a large bowl or dishpan. Gradually add two cups of warm water and beat with an egg beater till it looks like rich whipped cream. Then dip your hands right in and spread the snow along the branches with your fingers. The Lux snow by itself is lovely, but of course you can add lights and ornaments if you wish. The snow is a fine background for their bright colors. We put some on the wreaths in our windows, too. And when we got our tree, we got some extra branches. We spread them with Lux snow and put them in vases. Some in the dining room and some in front of a mirror in the hall. They make the whole house look so Christmassy. Remember, to make Lux snow for your tree or table decorations, use two cups of warm water to each large box of Lux flakes. Beat the mixture with an egg beater till it looks like thick whipped cream. Be sure to get the large box of Lux flakes. Your dealer has printed directions for making Lux snow. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. After the play, we'll give you a chapter of the true confessions of Frank Morgan. But now the curtain rises on the third act of The Pied Piper, starring Frank Morgan with Roddy McDowell, Ann Baxter, and Ralph Morgan. land of hope lay just across the channel, a few miles of water between refuge and despair. But Mr. Howard and the children were on the wrong side. They brought us to a house in the town, the headquarters of the Gestapo, the children and Nicole and Roquet and I. They took us before a major who sat smiling at us from behind his desk. Very touching, yes. A lovely group of children, mine Herr. I suppose you know that Charendon has been arrested. I haven't the foggiest idea what you're talking about. Nor have you ever heard of Major Cochrane, I suppose, of Room 212 Army Intelligence in the War Office in London. No. Your memory obviously needs freshening. So, an English gentleman traveling across France with five children, anxious only to get back home. A pretty and a most disarming device. It happens to be the truth. Who are these children? Where did you get them? The two English children belong to friends of mine. 
The others? You insist on this absurd story. You asked for the truth, didn't you? Yes, and I forget it. You see, we know who sent the information to the English of the Fuhrer's visit to the fleet at rest. We know who caused that raid. You and Sherendon. What we do not know and what you shall tell us is how that message was passed through to England. That is what you are going to tell us, Mr. Englishman. And as soon as it is told, the pain will stop. Not before. Take them away. Yeah. I say one question, please. Did they get him? Get whom? Hitler. Of course not. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> They took us out of the room, and then they brought me alone to another room down the hall and left me. There was a man sitting there. I'm afraid you have the advantage of me, sir. No, I'm English, too. Half at any rate. Oh, English? Well, what are you doing here? Uh, waiting to be shot. Oh, you're, you're Charendon. You've heard of me, eh? I'm supposed to be mixed up with you in some way, that raid on the ship. <laughs> Too bad we didn't get the little beggar. But I'll bet we scared him out of his pants. You mean you were responsible for that, really? Oh, I hope. They caught me, so there's no point in denying it. Only I wish they'd stop throwing innocent people in this room with me on the theory that they're going to convict themselves in some fashion. Really, I look for better things from you, Major Deason. More ingenious. Nothing as childlike as this. I say, are you feeling all right? Oh, quite. I'm assuming, of course, that there's a microphone in this room somewhere. Oh. They're listening to us right now. Yeah. You're wasting your time, Major. This man knows nothing about my affairs. But I will tell you this. The English will be back here, and the Americans, too. And I warn you, they'll not be as gentle as they were after the last war. They'll deal with you this time as they would with vermin. As for you, if you kill this old man, I can assure you that you will be hanged publicly and your body left to rot on the scaffold as a warning to your other murderers. That ought to hold him. You're, you're a very rash young man. Oh, I'm in for it anyway. <laughs> At least I can get a bit of satisfaction out of it. Major had evidently heard enough. A few minutes later, he sent for me again. We are throwing a little board with your friend Carandon. Really? If I were in your place, I would not dismiss what he says too lightly. Come here. If I were in your place, look out the window there. A very pleasant garden, isn't it? Very. That is where your friend, Mr. Carandon, is going to die in just a few minutes. Unless you decide to help him. I know nothing whatever of his work or how he went about it. And if I knew, I would not tell you. You would live. He would live. If you are sensible. But I have nothing to tell. Look. They are bringing him out. You see? It is a very little thing that I ask. Tell me how he got the information out of France. And I will stop this execution. I have told you truthfully, I do not know. You haven't much time. Think about it again. Nobody would ever know, I promise you. Can't you understand? I know nothing. As you wish. Just a few seconds now. Are you going to tell me? Well? Too late, I'm afraid. Oh, a pity. Come to the window. Wouldn't you like to see what you have done? Swine. Foul, filthy swine. Sit down. You puzzle me, really. If you are a spy, you are at least a very clever one. What did you intend to do with these children? What? These children. What did you plan to do with them? I don't know. I hadn't thought. Send them to America, I suppose. America? Why, America? I have a married daughter who lives in a district called Long Island. She would have made a home for them until the war was over. Are you seriously asking me to believe that a woman in America 
would make a home in her own house for five little dirty children that you have picked up? I am no longer interested in what you believe. Listen, I will confess to anything you wish if only you'll let them go. And Mademoiselle, too. If you'll do that, I'll, I'll confess to anything you say. It is impossible. I simply do not know what to make of you. I can only say that you must be a very brave man to make such an offer. No, no, not brave. Just old. It was not finished with me yet. The next day I saw him again, alone. I do not believe one word of your story about these children. Particularly about your plan to send them to America. I'll say anything you wish if you'll only let them go. What about the Jewish child? Jewish? The dark one. Is he Jewish? It didn't occur to me to ask. But in America, would they accept a Jewish child? I don't believe that they'd turn down any child, even a German. Even a German? Are you positive of that? Yes. Mr. Howard... How would you like to continue your trip to England? Not without the children. And Mademoiselle? No, no. She wants to stay here. That is what we want, too. Splendid. But if I were to let you go to England with the children, would you be grateful enough to do me a small service? That would depend on what it was. There is a certain person to be taken to America. I do not want to advertise her journey. If you think for one second that I'd introduce a German agent into America, you're an even greater fool than I've considered you. Remain seated, please. She could hardly act as an agent since she is only five years old. Five? Listen carefully. This little girl is my niece. Her father, my younger brother, is dead. My mother, we learn later, was not wholly Aryan, so we were compelled to dispose of her. But the unfortunate problem of the child remains. Half Aryan, half Jewish. She happens to be a sweet child. And I would feel better if she were with my older brother in the United States. He is an American citizen. Yeah, she'd be safer, you mean. If you wish. His name is Rupert Thiessen. He now has a business, a grocery in a city named Rochester, in New York State. His address... City? City of Rochester, New York. Are you positive? Of course I'm positive. What are you uh, talking about? Haven't you ever heard of it? Oh, uh, yes, yes, of course. Certainly I've heard of it. <laughs> His uh, address is 600 North 3rd Street, and that is where I want her to go. Meanwhile, uh, Mademoiselle may return to her home in shop. And no harm will come to her. Not unless you are foolish enough to tell anyone of this arrangement. Very well. I should be very glad to take the child and see that she's delivered to her uncle. What is your address in London? I shall send for you when we arrive there. 42 Curzon Street. Yours, I assume, will be a cell in the Tower of London. We were released that night, all of us. Roque had the boat ready and we stood lined up on the deck waiting for the little girl we were to take with us. She arrived with the Major, a tiny child carrying a doll in her arms. Oh, this must be Anna. How do you do, Anna? How do you do, Anna? Oh, Hitler. <laughs> Children, stop. Stop it immediately. Major Wilson, had not you better explain to Anna that from now on that salute will be out of place? Very well. Anna, from now on, you don't need to say anything to you. You come to the people who don't understand. <laughs> get aboard. I want to see you get away. Yeah. All of you, get aboard. Well, goodbye, Nicole. Goodbye. All of this I know you have done for my boy. And for him, I thank you. Some for him. Some for you, too. Once I thought there could never be another man as fine and as brave as your son. But I was wrong. And it was not all for you, either. It was for the children. Somehow, somehow they represent hope for the future. You are the past, I am the present. They are the future. So we must take very good care of them. I haven't all night, please. Au revoir, my dear. You'll, you'll come to see me when it's all over, and we'll talk about John. Oh, yes. One more thing, Mr. Englishman. There must be no trickery. 
If one word of this appears, it will be the concentration camp for your young lady. Remember that. And if anything happens to my young lady and I hear of it, this whole story will be in the papers and on the shortwave radio, mentioning you by name. And you remember that. You dare threaten me. You dare threaten me, didn't you? Go! Go! Uh, pff. Au revoir. Good luck. Happiness. Au revoir, Nicole. Well, we're on our way, children. I think you'd better all go below and see if you can't get some sleep. Do we have to take off our clothes tonight? No, you may sleep with them on tonight. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night my dear. Good night, little Anna. We're all friends now. Good enough, Sir Howard. Uh, oh, Ronnie. Yes, sir? There's, uh, there's a little matter I think I ought to clear up with you. What's that, sir? You, uh, you remember our little uh, discussion regarding uh, Rochester? Oh, yes, sir, but I told you. I know, but it, it seems that we were both wrong. Really, sir? Yes, I, I happened to be talking it over with a fellow the other night. The fellow knew all about it. It's not a state at all, it's a city. A city in New York State. Well, now, isn't that odd, sir, that we both should have made that same mistake? <laughs> You're really a very extraordinary boy, Ronnie. I'm very fond of you. And, uh, I apologize to you. We reached the English coast the next morning, and in three weeks I had seen them all off to America. That was over two years ago, but I hear from them quite often. Just yesterday I had six Christmas cards, six cards in round, childish hands, wishing me joy. And I wish them joy, too, for this Christmas, the next, all the Christmases to come. For this is what we are all fighting for. And this is our prayer. That there shall be other Christmases. That children of every land, of every race and color and creed, may laugh and play and sing on Christmas morning. And say, Merry Christmas to a brighter and a better world. Before our stars return for a curtain call, Here's a Christmas present we wish we could promise to the women in our audience. A way of getting all those Christmas dinner dishes clean without having to wash them. Well, that's a gift I'm afraid we'll have to leave for some future Santa Claus. But Lux Flakes can play Santa Claus for you by keeping your hands soft and smooth and pretty in spite of extra dishwashing. More than that, you can even make yourself a present of lovelier hands if you'll change to Lux for dishes. Yes, if your hands are red and rough from strong soaps in the dishpan, you can bring them back to their natural loveliness simply by changing to gentle Lux flakes. That has been proved in actual laboratory tests, proved by scores of women whose hands have been reddened and roughened by strong dishwashing soaps. When they change to gentle Lux, the redness began to disappear within a few days, and soon the hands grew soft and smooth and lovely again. They used no creams or lotions on their hands. They just changed to Lux. Yes, it's as easy as that, to change dishpan hands to soft, smooth Lux hands. So here's a note for your shopping list tomorrow. Get a big box of Lux Flakes for dishes. Now... Here's Mr. DeMille with our star. Now we welcome two members of the House of Morgan back to our stage. And with Frank and Ralph come Roddy McDowell and Ann Baxter. House of Morgan, eh, C.B.? 
I wonder if my banker ever thought of that. <laughs> You'd never suspect, C.D., that Frank has a hidden sorrow. I'll uh, bet he wants to play Hamlet. Oh, no. I had a very unfortunate experience with Hamlet. Don't, uh, don't tell me your tight rip. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> we, uh... We weren't doing well financially, and one night the sheriff paid us a visit. He walked right on the stage during the gravedigger scene and confiscated the shovel. <laughs> what was your hidden sorrow, Mr. Morgan? He failed at his chosen career. I always remember him at Christmas time standing up there with his shining face singing carols. He was a boy soprano in a church choir. How did you fail, Mr. Morgan? My voice changed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> How about the subject, Mr. DeMille? What about next week's play? Uh, there's good news about that, Anne. Because next week, we'll present the screen hit, A Star is Born. And our stars will be Judy Garland, Walter Pidgeon, and Adolf Mongeau. A Star is Born is a drama of Hollywood, of a girl who had the courage to fight for success and the courage to give it up. A great play and three great stars. That's really an inspiration, C.B. They'll be great in that play. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Don't forget to hang up your stockings. Before we say good night, I'd like to tell you my favorite Christmas story. It concerns a little boy named Pierre, and it happened in San Francisco some years ago. The pastor of a church in that city discovered one Christmas day that the figure of the Christ child was missing from a group depicting the nativity at Bethlehem. The pastor was leaving the church, wondering what kind of vandal could have done such a thing, when he was almost run over by the little boy, Pierre, pulling a little red wagon. And in the wagon was the tiny figure of the Christ child. The pastor was amazed and spoke severely to the boy, trying to explain the misdeed he had committed. The boy replied, but I, I prayed to the Lord for a red wagon, and I promised him that if I got it, I'd give the Christ child the very first ride in it. So, so I'm keeping my promise. It's his birthday. Ladies and gentlemen, on this Christmas of 1942, the civilized nations of the world are fighting for many freedoms, among them the right of little boys like Pierre to worship as they choose. And now, no matter where you may be, our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap, join me in wishing you every happiness of the Christmas season. And we invite you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater will present Walter Pigeon, Judy Garland, and Adolf Monjou in A Star is Born. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Did you know that when you roast a turkey or a chicken for Christmas dinner, you can help produce ammunition. Here's how it works. The manufacture of high explosive requires glycerin. Glycerin can be made from waste kitchen fats. You'll have some extra fats left over on Christmas, so send them off to war. Put all your waste fats in a clean, smooth-edged can and take them to your meat dealer regularly. Roddy McDowell and Ann Baxter appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studio. Roddy McDowell will soon be seen in the picture, My Friend Flicka, and Ann Baxter in Crash Dive. Heard in tonight's play were Deli Ellis, George Sorrell, Eric Snowden, Leo Cleary, Norman Field, Hal Gerard, Alec Harford, Claudine Logic, Noreen Gamil, Merrill Roden, Florette Zama, Maurice Tauzin, Mary Raymond, Vernon Steele, and Barbara Jean Wong. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next Monday night to hear Judy Garland, Walter Pidgeon, and Adolph Manju in A Star is Born. This Christmas, give the greatest gift of all, a chance to feel better. Give this.